Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this webinar. Today, it's a very technical content. We're going to talk about the single disciplinary body, breach reporting, the interdependency with reference checking, and the code of ethics. Now, of course, there will be CPD for the session this morning, and we have specifically set out with the intent of providing some professionalism and ethics content just before the end of the financial year, which we hope will be beneficial for members. Keep in mind that all webinar attendees will be on mute during the webinar, but you will have the chance to ask questions. I ask that you use the Q&A function rather than the chat function to ask those questions. Right. Today, we're going to provide an update on some key recent developments, and I think you'll find this interesting. Then we're going to dive into the single disciplinary body and talk about what that means for the end of FASIA, then breach reporting and reference checking, and uh, at the end, or for a decent chunk of the, the uh, webinar, we'll also talk about the code of ethics and where we're up to with the code of ethics. Uh, and what might be next. And we're also going to reserve some time at the end. And I have Kaz Garad here with me to manage the questions. So please uh, send those questions through. Right, let's dive into a couple of key recent updates. Now, uh, we've been dealing with an issue uh, over the last month or so. This came up as a result of discussion that I had following our, our um, annual renewal webinar on the 20th of April, when I was working through some of the questions that we had received, and I was looking at the definition of transition day. And transition day for an ongoing fee arrangement means the earlier of the day when a fee disclosure statement is given. And then I was reflecting upon the requirement during the transition year to provide a fee disclosure statement um, and it needs to relate to the period of 12 months the previous year ending immediately before the transition day. So we came out of that thinking this looks impossible. How can you possibly provide a fee disclosure statement to a client that covers a 12-month period that ends the day immediately before uh, the day that it needs to be provided to the client? So as a result of that, we took that concern to ASIC, Treasury and the government. And last Friday, the minister issued a media release saying that they had come up with a solution. And that solution, which will be achieved through a regulation, um, hopefully we'll see that before the end of this month. Uh, and, and timing is critical because annual renewal starts in two weeks' time. Now, the end outcome is that the FDS must still be delivered one day after the end of the period, and I'll talk to an example in a moment. However, it is only required to include 10 months of actual fee data and an estimate for the remaining two months of the year. Now, if we use the example that we have here for uh, an FDS period from 1 October 2020 to 31, uh, sorry, to 30 September uh, 2022, uh, sorry, 2021, um, what it actually means is you need to provide the actual fees for the 10 months from October 2020 to the 31st of July 2021. Now, you should be able to get that data in August of 2021 because you've still got two months left. You can prepare an estimate for those remaining two months. You've got the chance to package it up and then you need to provide the FDS on the 1st of October. Keeping in mind that you need to provide the FDS the day after the end of the period and it's the day that you provide the FDS that sets the anniversary for future years. So as you can see in this example, um, with the actuals for those first 10 months and the estimates for the last two months, it gives you two months to pull that FDS together and do all the necessary checks before you provide it to the client. 
We understand that this is going to add extra complexity, um, but at least it is a workaround to what would have otherwise been a fundamental problem that would have led to um, ongoing fee arrangements being terminated. Now, I want to move on to another issue that's come up recently, and I'm, I'm very conscious that for many members, the FASEA exam is something that drives a great deal of, of stress and emotion. Um, and we're, we're bringing this to you because we think it's important that, that you are aware um, uh, it's, a, it's a recent important development. Now, at Senate estimates on the 2nd of June, WA Senator Ben Small, who, who some of our members um, have been in touch with, posed a question uh, to Fasia, And basically, he was asking a question about what is going to happen to those advisors who, for whatever reason, are unable to pass the exam by the end of this year, and particularly if they were sitting the exam in November um, and they found out um, just a couple of weeks before Christmas that they had failed um, for their last chance, what would happen? And Stephen Glenfield, uh, the CEO of FASIA, came back to say that you do have an option under the Corporations Act to come back and sit the exam next year. Now, this was a bit of a surprise to us, and we had to dig into this, including um, talking to FASEA and, and since talking to ASIC. And I'm just going to quickly explain that. And this is quite technical, and I'm sorry, a lot of the presentation this morning is going to be quite technical, but I want to take you through this so that you do have an understanding. An existing provider is defined in Section 1546 of the Corporations Act as a person who is a relevant provider at any time between 1 January 2016 and 1 January 2019, except for a person um, who ceases to be a relevant provider under subsections 1546B, 4 and 5. Now, 5 is the one that's relevant here because 5 relates to the exam. So if we go then and have a look at 1546B, and I need to refer to three and five, um, because three talks about an existing provider must have met the education and training standard in subsection 921B3, which is a, the core obligations under the professional standards regime before 1 January, 2022. And critically, five, because five is, um, is referred to in the definition of an existing provider, if at the start of 1 January 2022, a person who is an existing provider and a relevant provider at that time fails to comply with subsection three, which is the completion of the exam, the person is taken for the purposes of this act after that time to have ceased to be a relevant provider. So that basically means that if you hadn't passed the exam by 1 January 2022, then you would no longer be an existing provider and you would therefore have needed, if you wanted to come back, to come back as a new advisor, complete a full degree and also go through the professional year. However, um, it turns out that, and we were aware of this, but we hadn't of, of this um, legislative instrument, but we hadn't connected the two issues. ASIC issued a legislative instrument in October 2018. And in effect, it changed 1546B33 such that it was then worded as an existing provider that immediately before 1 January 2021 is a relevant provider must have met. Um, the, the condition of passing the exam. So they changed it so that it only applied if you were on the register immediately before 1 January um, 2022, as the case may be now, because the exam deadline has been pushed back. So what it means is there is an option for someone to cease on the register before the end of this year if they have not passed the exam subsequently pass the exam and then come back afterwards. Now, we provide um, feedback to all members that this is not a great option. This does not give a simple solution because um, first of all, you would have to cease on the register. You would be suspended 
um, you would need to come up with an alternative solution for how you would service your clients. Because if you're unable to service your clients, then that would mean that um, you'd have to turn off ongoing fee arrangements. And also, FASEA comes to an end at the end of this year and the responsibility for the exam is passed back to ASIC and we have no timetable for when exams may be run next year. Now, we'll have more to say about this um, over the next few weeks, but we thought it's important to brief members on this issue because this development has caused further confusion. Um, we, we continue to strongly encourage members to have a go at the exam and do everything you possibly can to pass the exam before the end of this year. So that was a couple of items that are recent developments that we've been actively involved in that we wanted to update you on. Now I wanna run a poll question here. Um, we remain very committed to doing what we can to help members get through the exam and we'll, we'll have more to say on this uh, over, over coming months. There's three more attempts left, but I want to ask um, uh, those who are on the webinar for them to respond to this poll question. Uh, and the question is, what is your status with the completion of the FASEA exam? I've passed the exam. I've sat the exam, but not yet passed. I've not sat the exam yet, but intend to sit this year. And I do not intend to sit the exam. So we got numbers, um, numbers coming through here. Um, and we'll keep it open for uh, just a little bit longer. Uh, at this stage, we've got uh, responses from 130 of the 189 who are currently on the webinar. And really positive um, outcome here is that 70%, 71% are saying that they, uh, they have passed. So I'll end that poll and we'll share the results there. So 70% um, indicating that they have already passed the exam, 13% saying that they've sat it but are yet to pass. Um, and, and this is one of the groups that we, we really want to focus on. And a further 10% uh, who have not yet sat the exam but still intend to sit it at one of the remaining three sittings. And just 7% of those people on the webinar today do not intend um, to sit the exam. Thank you for those results and we'll, uh, we'll keep moving now. Okay, so the single disciplinary body. Let's go through some of the background with respect to the single disciplinary body. Now, uh, we know that the original intent of the professional standards legislation was the creation of what was called code monitoring bodies who would uh, in many ways have been the, the professional associations who would have responsibility for monitoring compliance with the code. But the Royal Commission came along in February of 2019 and recommended the establishment of a single disciplinary body. So the government in October of 2019 announced the intention to scrap the plan for, a, um, for code monitoring bodies. Uh, and that was a, a pretty critical development because what it meant was that for a period of time, there was no body in place to oversight uh, compliance with the code. And then in December last year, there was a um, joint media release uh, from our minister and the treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, to um, put in place uh, the, in, the single disciplinary body, but also announced the winding up of FASEA as part of that. Their proposal was that ASIC's financial services and credit panel would be expanded to include the management of disciplinary matters uh, and also the administration of the exam. And policy matters would be passed back to treasury with the minister being the ultimate decision maker. So let's have a look at, uh, at the detail around the single disciplinary body. The government issued 
exposure draft legislation on the 19th of April. And uh, we we're all given around three or four weeks to respond to that. Now, if I take you through the details here, the proposal in that exposure draft legislation was that new regime would commence on the 1st of January next year. This is, of course, subject to it being passed by the, leg by the parliament. Uh, and I should make the point that the legislation is yet to be tabled in the parliament. Um, so we're not certain exactly when it will be um, in front of the parliament. The single disciplinary body will be required under this draft legislation to review all breaches of the law and breaches of the code of ethics. So to have very wide remit. There will be a range of new penalties for financial advisors who breach their obligations. At the moment, um, ASIC has limited options available to it. It can either um, ban an advisor or can uh, enter into an enforceable undertaking with them, but it has no capacity for, for more moderate uh, or minor penalties to apply. The Financial Services and Credit Panel um, that would be set up to consider each matter would comprise one person from ASIC who'd play the role of chair and two industry representatives. And the leg draft legislation identified um, the sort of individuals who might be um, possible to sit on this panel. We've obviously advocated for the fact that they need an understanding of financial advice. Now, the broader panel will be um, based upon people who are nominated by the minister, but it's ASIC that will appoint a specific panel. Financial advisors would now need to be registered with ASIC and uh, for the first time, although they're already on the financial advisor register, um, but this first registration will occur in the year between 1 January 2022 and 1 January 2023. It would be done by licensees, but it comes in as an annual process that includes a declaration by the licensee and by the advisor that they continue to be a fit and proper person. There would also be a new registration fee that would apply. Now, for all those who are currently registered with a TPB, where you have paid your TPB registration fee, that registration would be transferred over automatically to ASIC and any outstanding registration period would be credited to you. Tax financial advisors will no longer be required to be reg registered separately with the TPB. And also importantly, the proposal is that FASIA would be wound up from the 1st of January, 2022, and that the minister would be responsible for the setting of standards beyond that point. And ASIC would have responsibility for the administration of the exam, um, keeping in mind that by next year, we are now then talking predominantly about new entrants. And they would also have responsibility for the approval of overseas qualifications. Now, the minister and the government have been um, quite specific to suggest that these changes do not mean that we should have unrealistic expectations about changes to either the exam or the education standards. And those standards that currently apply will stay in place. That does not stop us from advocating for more sensible reforms to what applies now. Um, but it does not allow us to be unrealistic about what the expectations might be. So let's talk about penalties. Um, obviously, you know, th this is the confronting part of, of this new regime. So ASIC would retain the power to um, take banning action, but the panel would have the ability to uh, have uh, put in place penalties that could include termination, suspension, referral of a matter to ASIC to pursue civil, civil penalty court proceedings. They could also accept a written enforceable undertaking. There is also going to be the new option of infringement notices. And, and on my rough estimates, they would amount to around $2,500. The panel could also issue a written warning or reprimand and could also provide a direction to an advisor to undertake training, counselling 
or to put in place additional supervision mechanisms. In addition, any outcome of an FSCP could, and in most cases probably would, be recorded on the Financial Advisor Register. Of course, um, one of the obvious outcomes of an FSP, FSCP is that they could recommend that no further action is taken. Now we put it together a couple of slides and I'll take you through this one. This talks about the initial triage process. So um, matters could arise either from AFCA, the TPB, professional associations, ASIC's own monitoring and surveillance, consumer complaints, um, licensee breach reports, um, or any other um, mechanism that these matters could be brought to ASIC's attention. ASIC would need to make an initial assessment as to whether there was um, possible misconduct or there was no point pursuing the, the matter. They would undertake initial investigation um, and, and using the information that has been provided in their own evidence gathering to decide um, whether they believe there's a breach uh, or that they believe that there's no reason to take any further action. If they believe there's a breach, they then need to make an assessment as to whether it could be something that could lead to a banning action, in which, in which case they would run with it and, and there'd be no change to their current process. Or alternatively, they might um, think it's not a banning matter and pass it to the FSCP. Now, I'm, I'm not going to take you through this slide uh, other than to say that where a matter does come before the FSCP, they need to give the advisor the opportunity to respond either through a written submission or a hearing in front of a panel. And should the advisor um, ultimately be dissatisfied with the outcome, they also have the ability to refer the matter to the AAT. Now, this slide will be available as part of the presentation for you to read later on, should you choose to do so. All right, now, we have um, made a submission to Treasury in response to this exposure draft, and we've made some, some key points. We do not want these FSCPs or these, the panel to be looking at minor and administrative matters. Keep in mind that any breach of the law could go in front of an FSCP and many of the breaches are minor and administrative. Um, and, and I'll talk more about that when we talk about breach reporting. We believe that the FSCP should have a, a secretariat team and they should be the, the ones responsible for the triage process. We've asked for greater certainty on the penalties that might apply. We've also said that infringement notices, and that's fines of, of around $2,500, should not apply in the case of minor and particularly administrative matters. We have called on the government to ensure that the single disciplinary body is not an overly expensive beast, um, because we know too well that that will flow through to financial advisors through the ASIC funding levy. They need to ensure that the end model is pragmatic and key to that is making sure that they're not looking at minor and administrative matters, that they're focusing their attention on more serious matters. We've also suggested that there should be some form of governance forum over and above the single disciplinary body that is brought up to speed with what is happening within the single disciplinary body so that it provides some mechanism for industry oversight. We've also suggested that there should be no additional education and training requirement for tax financial advisors. Just about every advisor needs to be registered with the TPB or to be monitored or supervised by someone who is and tax financial advice is almost always um, a factor in any advice that's provided. So we believe that this extra layer of complexity should be removed. And in the context of the scale of the changes that are being made, 
the unlikelihood of this being legislated anytime soon. We have suggested that commencement should be pushed back until 1 July of next year, rather than um, 1 January of 2022. Now I'm gonna at this point move on to breach reporting and the interdependency with reference checking. Now breach reporting is a responsibility that sits with licensees, um, acknowledging that a, a number of the 200 people we have on the webinar at the moment will also be licensees, but it's important for advisors to understand the new breach reporting regime, because ultimately uh, it is most often that licensees will be reporting breaches by individual advisors. And you um, importantly should understand the consequences of that. Now breach reporting is an issue that has been in the spotlight in the past. And there was a, a government task force called the ASIC Enforcement Task Force that looked at this a few years ago uh, and, and issued a recommend, set of recommendations to government. It was also something that was looked at by the Royal Commission and they made some recommendations with respect to tightening up the regime. Now, there was a bill that went before the parliament in November and was quickly pushed through in December that included a number of different measures. It was a very large bill, 159 pages, and the explanatory statement was around 360 pages, but it included some key issues, um, one of which was breach reporting, another one was reference checking. So this is all legislated and it's due to start from the 1st of October this year. So key parts to it, a complex and much broader definition of a reportable breach. Um, one that we find quite striking, which is an obligation for licensees to report financial advisors and mortgage brokers from other licensees. And I might just pause on this. You'll see references to mortgage brokers a number of times in the discussion about breach reporting. Um, and reference checking. There are some people who think that mortgage brokers got let off from the Royal Commission. The only thing that mortgage brokers got let off on, so to speak, was the recommendation around the removal of commissions for mortgage broking. Mortgage brokers have been caught through the Royal Commission in many different ways, including the introduction of a, of a best interest duty, but also being very much tied up in the breach reporting and reference checking regime. So I'll talk to that a little bit more as we go through this. So yes, an obligation for licensees to report financial advisors and mortgage brokers from other licensees. Now, keep in mind that licensees can be product providers as well. So you could have a product provider or a life insurer or a super fund providing breach reports on things that they see with respect to financial advisors. We suspect it's more likely that uh, AFSL advice licensees will be the ones who are needing to report advisors. There are also additional obligations with respect to investigation of breaches and notifying impacted clients and remediation of impacted clients. And I'll talk to more on that in a moment. ASIC have recently issued a new draft regulatory guide, um, RG78 on breach reporting, and the AFA recently made a submission to that, which we will be releasing later this week. So let's, to, let's dive in to have a look at what a reportable breach might be. Um, Section 912D of the Corporations Act is the um, significant breach reporting requirement. It has been in place before. It was relatively straightforward. There were four elements of it in the past, uh, although there was some criticism about how it wasn't applied consistently and, and in particular, how some of the large institutions were slow to report breaches to ASIC. So the government in their wisdom have decided to go away and make this incredibly complex and incredibly prescriptive. 
It is, in my view, the most remarkably complex piece of legislation uh, that I've seen in my time in, in working in the regulatory space. So I'll take you through that. A breach um, is defined as a breach of a core obligation that is significant. And we'll come back to reflect on what core obligations are and what significant is. It also might be a case where a licensee um, makes an assessment that they have become incapable of complying with their core obligations in the future. Where a licensee is conducting an investigation into whether there is a reportable situation and that investigation continues for more than 30 days, then that becomes reportable. And where that invest investigation is, is subsequently um, completed and it, uh, the end outcome is that there is not a reportable situation, because you've already reported the investigation, you have to report back to say, that the investigation has revealed that there is no reportable situation. Conduct that constitutes gross negligence is also uh, subject to breach reporting, as is serious fraud. Uh, and obviously, you know, we have no objection about gross negligence and serious fraud being reported to ASIC. So let's have a look at what a core obligation is. Now, um, for those uh, on, the, on the call who are compliance experts or lawyers and might have dug into this, this is a remarkably complex definition because you get redirected to multiple different places to ultimately end up with the same understanding, which is that it's a breach of a licensee's general obligations and they're defined in sections 912A and 912B. It's a breach of certain chapters of the Corporations Act and certainly chapter seven, which is the core chapter that applies to financial advice is caught under that definition. A breach of division two of part two of the ASIC Act. And there is also provision um, for other breaches of other Commonwealth law to be inserted through regulation. So for us, um, this really means that it's any breach of chapter seven of the Corporations Act, given that 912A and 912B are in chapter seven. So what is significant? So this is broken down into a number of different elements, but there are probably two that are most important. The first one is the breach of an offense provision under the law, under any law, where an imprisonment, a maximum imprisonment penalty is for three months or more for dishonesty or otherwise for 12 months or more. The breach of a civil penalty provision, except where it's exempted through the regulations and, and Treasury are currently consulting on which um, penalty obligations should be exempted. A breach of the misleading and deceptive conduct obligations a breach that results in material loss or damage to a client and any other circumstances provided um, prescribed by the regulation. And if you want to understand what an offence provision is under the Corporations Act, go to Schedule 3 of the Act and for civil penalty provisions, look at Section 1317E. What do licensees need to do? Licensees have 30 days to report a breach. Licensees now need to commence an investigation of a matter that could potentially be a breach. If that investigation is not concluded within 30 days, um, then, then you need to report. And within 30 days of concluding the investigation, they also need to report to ASIC. The report must be provided to ASIC in the prescribed form, which is through the ASIC portal. Reporting advisors from other licensees. Um, this is something that we find quite remarkable, but it applies in the case of a significant breach or likely breach or a matter involving gross negligence or serious fraud. It only applies to financial advisors and mortgage brokers. So if a product provider uh, is knowingly doing the wrong thing, no one has an obligation to report them. Licensees must report to ASIC within 30 days. Yeah. And licensees must also provide a copy of the report to the other licensee within 30 days. 
Failing to submit the report to ASIC or the other licensee is a civil penalty provision. And as a civil penalty provision, it is also reportable. So you need to think in, in terms of, from a licensee perspective, the consequences for a licensee that's doing, doing due diligence on an advisor that they're in the process of recruiting and you're starting to look at files. What if you identify something through that due diligence that becomes reportable. Now, finally, talking about notifying and remediating impact clients, impacted clients. Licensees now have new obligations in this space. Where there is a reportable situation and the, the licensee um, must notify the client where the client has received personal advice as a retail client and there are reasonable grounds to suspect that the affected client has suffered or will suffer loss or damage, and the client has a legally enforceable right to recover the loss or damage. The licensee has 30 days to issue the notice. The licensee must also undertake an investigation where they suspect a matter and they're, uh, where there's potentially affected clients. Clients must be notified within 10 days of the completion of the investigation and remediated within 30 days after the investigation is completed. So there are important new obligations that apply as a result of this change when it comes to affected clients and remediation. Breach reporting also impacts reference checking. And I'll explain this, um, this here. So mandatory reference checking comes into place from the 1st of October this year. And it will apply to licensees who are doing the recruiting and for licensees who might be the current licensee or the former licensee of that advisor. ASIC is going to put in place a reference checking protocol uh, and it will become mandatory for financial advisors and mortgage brokers. Just financial advisors and mortgage brokers, so senior executives and product providers or well, life insurers are not impacted, but financial advisors are. Um, now the draft ASIC protocol, and they have consulted on this, um, refers to where the reference must, uh, must be sought from, the need for seeking consent and the obligation to provide updates. Now why this is linked to breach reporting is that reference checks will need to include details on any breaches that have been with, reported with respect to that advisor or any ongoing investigations that are underway. So there is a very important linkage there. Now we're gonna conclude by talking about the FASIA code. Now um, the, the process to get to this point has been long and drawn out. We've seen the consultation around the code itself with the code finally being issued in February of 2019. And since that time, uh, the FASIA have consulted on three separate occasions with respect to the code and the guidance around the code. And ASIC has also stepped in to put in place what they've described as a facility compliance approach with respect to standard three and standard seven until the single disciplinary body is operational. And we've already talked about the single disciplinary body. So the, the code commenced on the 1st of January 2020. So it's been in place for nearly um, 18 months and licensees are expected to take reasonable steps to ensure that their advisors are complying with the code. ASIC has said that they will not be monitoring uh, or enforcing compliance with the code by individual advisors. And they've also put in place that facility of compliance approach whilst we await the single disciplinary body, um, which is likely to be next year. The code, as we know, has 12 standards and five values. Those five um, values, uh, which are, are, at, are very much um, quite reasonable and are appropriate, trustworthiness, competence, honesty, fairness, and diligence. And the 12 codes or standards are split into ethical behavior, client care, quality process, and professional commitment. Now, I'm just going to focus firstly on where we think there are continuing areas of uncertainty. 
um, and also um, highlight some of the particular standards. So the areas of uncertainty uh, that remain are paying for the receipt of referrals, which is a, a common business model, um, particularly referrals from accountants. Receipt of referral fees by licensees and cars, given that uh, the code applies to individuals, conflict of interest and duties, obtaining consent from existing clients and scaled advice, including the fact find requirements and the consideration of likely future circumstances. Now, standard three has always been the one that has generated the most heat. You must not advise, refer or act in any other manner where you have a conflict of interest. Now, it's very broad um, and it's in many ways it's impractical because of the breadth of it. So it doesn't just apply to life insurance commissions or asset based fees or recommending shares or products that you own. It's also referral arrangements. It could also be recommending um, products where you have friends or family who work for those product providers. Also, the origin of it has been clouded in controversy, and we've seen this play out through parliamentary inquiries um, with, reflect, uh, with respect to submissions that were received from uh, university academics. Um, and the explanation of how to apply it is both complex and confusing. I think FASEA did come to the party uh, in December 2019 in their guidance on this to say that in the context of life insurance commissions, they were still permissible, provided it complied with five conditions. And they were that the, the advice and the recommendation was in the best interest of the client, <clears throat> which was an existing obligation, and we certainly couldn't um, object to that. The commission received was fair and reasonable and represented value for money as fully understood by the client. And this links to some of the other um, standards in the, in the code, including standard seven. The client understands the benefits, risks, uh, costs, risks of the insurance advice, which is an existing obligation. So we have no issue with that. The advice and fee structure are appropriate for the client. Um, more guidance obviously was required with respect to that. And a disinterested or unbiased person in possession of all the facts would reasonably conclude that the remuneration would not lead the advisor to prefer the interests of someone other over the interests of the client. And that came down to what that disinterested person test might actually require. Similar rules applied with respect to asset-based fees and brokerage arrangements. In October of 2020, FASIA provided further guidance around the situation in which uh, a conflict was, um, uh, was one where action needed to be taken. And we actually quite uh, appreciated the, the further reference to uh, the fact that financial advisors would be able to rely on their professional judgment interpreting the code um, with modern best practice in, in, in professions. Now, this is really important because it's one of the issues that we do not see the current law allowing is professional judgment by financial advisors. So we think that's a, a message heading in the right direction. But then um, what is actually required in, in complying with this standard of judgment is a very complex position that you need to put yourself in. Now, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but it is um, it, it does require you to give very specific consideration to the circumstances as to whether um, it does cause a conflict of interest that needs to be avoided. Referral fees remain an outstanding issue. There's no question that the receipt of referral fees are definitely banned. But also there are issues with respect to reciprocal um, referral fee arrangements. FASIA seemingly, seemingly expects that you would have multiple referral partners. However, this may not always be possible. 
And in October of 2019, FASIA hinted to the fact that there would be a ban on the payment for referrals. Um, and this has obviously been a, an area of concern for many members who have existing arrangements in place. Now, it's interesting to, to see some recent um, questions on notice that came out of Senate estimates where Senator Slade Brockman from Western Australia asked the question. He said, there has been criticism of the FASIA Code of Ethics and particularly Standard 3 on a complete ban of conflicts of interest. Will FASIA seek to amend Standard 3 before um, they cease operations? And the answer back from FASIA, and, um, and obviously uh, this has had some media coverage, is that they have consulted um, uh, and most recently in October last year on the, on the guidance around the code. And as a result of that, they've received a range of feedback, uh, including um, some suggestions to say that they should incorporate the wording of the guidance uh, in the code or revert to the original wording of the standard re inappropriate advantage or change the standard to provide for a disclose and manage approach. FASIA have also said that they plan to consult on Standard 3 um, this year and will continue on working on enhancing and refining it before they cease operations. So, so this does suggest that Standard 3 um, may be changed by FASIA um, whilst they are continuing to operate. Standard 4 caused a lot of um, concern because this is about ob obtaining client consent from existing clients and the suggestion through the guidance in October 2020 that this might apply uh, in the case of um, commissions being received by financial advisors. And we were concerned about this because it was weaving in to standard four issues with respect to fees and, and remuneration, which should have been addressed through standard seven. And of course, standard seven has the benefit of the facility of compliance approach, which standard four does not have. And, and in that guidance, they did draw into um, situations where uh, a client um, paying life insurance commissions may not have been in recent contact with the advisor and whether obligations would apply. Now, we think this is an issue where there is a need for further guidance. Um, and at this stage, uh, um, we're still unclear on what exactly will be required. Standard seven is a really important standard because it relates to the receipt of remuneration and you will, of course, be conscious of the fact that in this standard, they refer to the fact that, that you need to be um, confident that the, the, the payments that the clients are making are fair and reasonable and represent value for money for the client. Now, fair and reasonable is one thing, but representing value for the money for the client is, is a complex concept because it can only be defined in the eyes of the client. And what we have suggested is that in order to be prepared to answer this question, advisors should be thinking about benchmarking the costs of services that they provide to different cohorts. So if you have a package of services that you provide to a cohort of clients, it's worthwhile thinking through what services do you provide? What are the costs of providing those services? And therefore, are your, fair, are your fees fair and reasonable in that context? Also, given the, the value for money element of this standard, we're recommending that advisors are asking clients questions to understand where they see value in the advice. Now, this could be part of the review process, and it's something that if you document, you're, you're keeping a record of where that value is demonstrated. It's also going to provide good insight into what your clients are thinking about the services that you provide. And one last standard that I will reflect upon before we go to questions is standard 12. 
individually and in cooperation with peers, you must uphold and promote the ethical standards the profession of the profession and hold each other accountable for the protection of the public interest. Now, this is something that I, I think we should support, but uh, it does play out in different areas. And one of them is uh, something that we have seen a lot of focus on in the last um, six to eight months, which is advice being provided by those who are unlicensed. And I think we all have a role to play in, in calling that out where we see it. But I've also included in this slide um, a picture of a high court judge who has come under criticism for the way he's conducted himself. And I think we all have a role to play in terms of calling out conduct that mightn't be advice related, but where it is obviously inappropriate. And those sorts of things should not happen uh, in our industry and in our businesses. So there is um, things to be taken out of standard 12 that are broader, and it's important to think about how we are applying those uh, expectations within our practice. So we now have um, uh, eight or nine minutes for questions. So um, I'm going to now um, ask Kaz to uh, read out the questions that we have and we'll go through those. Okay. So we do have a question here in relation to breach reporting. Um, and the question is, do licensees have any obligation to tell the financial advisor if they've lodged a breach report against them? No. The answer to that is no. And that's a, that's a good question. Um, and, and one of the things that uh, the law has introduced is that there are protections for the licensee in disclosing information to other licensees and in disclosing um, information with respect to a reportable situation to clients. But there is no requirement to disclose a, a breach has been reported to the advisor that's the subject of the breach. And that's something that um, we are feeling um, uncomfortable about because that breach, when it um, is subsequently reported in a reference check, may be something that the advisor is just not aware of. But the answer to that question is no, there's no obligation that I'm aware of um, where the licensee needs to advise the advisor. And, and keep in mind, you know, it, it could be um, a situation where uh, they have terminated an advisor and they subsequently, uh, as part of the investigation of as what's happened, um, report them to ASIC. So there are various situations where it might arise, but there is no obligation seemingly to notify the advisor. And that has been the, the practice in the past. Okay, so we've got a fee disclosure question. Um, and the question is, if the client was to pay fees um, due that, sorry, start again. If the client pays fees in June, for June on the 4th of July, but the FDS anniversary date or due date is 1st of July, there's no need to include the payment of those June fees that aren't received until the 4th of July. Is that right? All right. Um, this is not an annual renewal, an FDS uh, session, but I did talk about the, the development at the start. The answer is, it is ASIC's view that you need to report FDSs on the basis of fees that come out of a client's account. And if they come out of the client's account in June, even though they are paid to you in July, it is ASIC's view that you would need to report them um, for June. And ASIC issued a report 636 on FDS and renewal compliance. And they made this point strongly in that report and suggested that in order to comply with that requirement, advisors would need to 
manually check that the amounts that they had included in fee disclosure statements um, were correct by looking at product systems to confirm that. So um, this is an issue that we have been advocating with the government on um, for some time, asking them to fix the issue because advisor systems are set up to report on the basis of when they receive the fees, not when they are taken out of the client's account. This is one of our ongoing advocacy issues and, um, and I'll say more about that uh, if and when we have a, a, an acceptable result. Okay, so we've, we've got a couple of exam questions um, and I think it's worth discussing. Um, one of the questions was about the exam dates that are available for the remainder of 2021. Uh, which are July, September and November. Um, and the observation was if somebody fails the July exam, they only have the November opportunity to do the exam. Is that correct? Um, as you know very well that that's correct. Yes, so the um, three exams left. If you sit July, you can also sit November and um, FASIA has made a particular point uh, of ensuring that's the case. If you if you sit and fail September, you do not have another option this year. And um, yeah, that that's that's that. Uh, we'll have more to say uh, about this recent development about being suspended from the register until you um, subsequently pass at a later point. Mm. And that's um, probably a nice leeway into the next question. Um, for those advisors that perhaps couldn't pass the exam by the 31st of December, you know, would there be any transition period put in place to allow them to exit their businesses? Anything that you can talk about that? I can say that we have uh, asked the government to provide that. Um, we would like to see a provision where uh, and someone who has had a decent crack at the exam, but uh, ultimately for whatever reason has been unable to pass, and particularly if they get the result in November, uh, sorry, they sit the November exam and don't get the result in December, to be forced out from the 1st of January 2022 is very rough. And so we have put forward an idea to the government that there could be a six month grace period. Um, I'm not overly optimistic that, uh, that we will succeed with that, but um, it is something that we have asked for. Um, someone has asked about whether a financial advisor can access their own refer reference check report from ASIC. Um, so you can't um, access it from ASIC because ASIC will not receive the um, reference check. The reference check needs to be provided by your current or former licensee to the licensee that's doing the recruiting exercise. And I'm not aware of any provision that allows an advisor to request a copy of it. So I, I think the answer is, is most likely no. So we do have a question about if, if an advisor was to come across a breach, say a, not supplying a statement of advice, um, what, what should they do? Should they tell their client to report this to their current advisor's licensee or what should they do? So a good question. Um, so, I mean, uh, if the advisor becomes aware of it and, and it might be you know, failure to provide a, an SOA, it could be something with respect to the best interest duty. Um, the, the issue is, should they need to report it to um, the licensee of the other advisor? Now, the obligation is only on the licensee to report breaches 
of um, of other other advisors or advisors from other licensees. Advisors do not have an obligation unless they're self-licensed to report breaches. The question is, if an advisor is aware, if an authorised representative is aware, is the licensee also expected to be aware and are they therefore required to make that breach report? And that's a question that I'm uh, waiting an answer on. All right, um, we are out of time. Um, I would like to thank Kaz for dealing with those questions and we will have a look at the, any further questions. I'd like to thank everyone for joining the, the webinar today. I appreciate that it's been a lot of heavy technical content and, um, uh, and that's been tough going, but it is important context ar around the changes that we have um, coming through this year or, or into next year with a single disciplinary body. And of course, everyone who has been on for the majority of the webinar will get the benefit of accessing CPD for today. So once again, I thank you for your participation and, uh, and look forward to talking to you at the next opportunity to present a webinar. Many thank you.